Programming Throwdown, episode number three, Erlang. Take it away, Jason. Hey, how's it going? So we're in a we're in a live setting today, which is different. Usually this is over Skype, but today uh, we're here uh, playing some board games, hanging out over at my place. So we decided to uh, use the Omni mic, which looks awesome. Yeah, it does. It looks pretty cool. Yeah. Makes you feel like a real radio personality, right? Yeah, yeah, in Mars, <laughs> in the future. Future Martian radio. Yeah. Nice. I'm still convinced that Patrick bought this at a pawn shop in the future. Nice. All right. Well, you got any news for us? Um, <clears throat> so uh, probably one of the biggest things that has come out is the ISO standard on C++ uh, came out. Was it March 28th? And uh, this kind of finalizes uh, what's been uh, C++ OX, which is now C++ 2011. And uh, it has a bunch of different additions. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about um, C earlier, and uh, you know, we might do a show on C++ later on. And uh, one of the biggest things is uh, this adds a lot of kind of the features of higher level languages, like some memory management. So it has an auto pointer and a shared pointer, and uh, it really has a lot of awesome features that will make C++ programming a lot easier. I mean, C++ right now still uh, you know dominates most of the uh, industrial uh, you know software world so something like this is big news yeah I, unfortunately i guess they missed their uh, deadline with the ox thing and now they <laughs> yeah. have to call it o11 <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right x was not just a one character i guess it was actually two but yeah i mean that's that's a big deal so it'll probably take a few years before it starts working its way into the mainstream compilers and stuff but yeah, so it's already in, uh, I think, GCC um, in the latest version of Visual Studio. Oh, okay. But, uh, but yeah, by the time, you know, other, you know, by the time those actually become adopted by corporations, I mean, there are some companies that are still using GCC 2.9, you know, so. Yeah, or the, Visual Studio 2005. Yeah, that's right. So uh, by the time, you know, people move on to using GCC, was it 4.5, I think, is the one with C++ 2011 or Visual Studio 2010. Uh, you know, it's probably going to be, like you said, you know, five years from now at least. Something to look forward in the future with our better radio equipment. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And our better C, compil- C++ compilers. Yep. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, I had a, a news story that I saw this week about uh, Google hiring the inventor of Java, the guy who actually holds um, some of the patents there and worked for Sun, now Oracle, on creating the Java language. Uh, and they hired him to work on Android, which, of course, Android runs um, a Java virtual machine, the Dalvik virtual machine, their own version, own implementation of it. And additionally, are being presently sued by Oracle. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, on in regards to some patent infringement that's alleged there, uh, and so they hired the this guy who's really key to the invention of Java. And there's a you know some speculation about exactly what they were thinking there. Um, one to obviously make the Dalvik virtual machine better. You know, get the guy who is in the know, get him there, get him working on it. Uh, make it you know just better and uh, you know also this guy is you know pretty well respected java is is very popular very commonly used and it's a you know a, a kind of he's kind of a star so I, I his name is escaping me right now but i mean basically he is able to uh, james gosling okay james yeah. gosling. so but i mean him being in google now is going to mean people are going to want to go work at google not that they're of want of people wanting that work there any more than they already do but now they're going to recruit even more top talent to go work there and you know want to work next to to mr gosling there and you know be with this kind of i guess rock star yeah Um, i think that maybe um someone one of the vps at google you know is getting programming language inventors a little confused with pokemon because he's (laughs) trying to collect every single one of them Gotta catch them all. Got Guido for Python, and now James Gosling, and uh, you know the guy who invented Go already worked at Google, the Go programming language. So, uh, so yeah, it's kind of an interesting. So they're forming a collect. Maybe they're cornering the market on new programming languages. Yeah, it's it's quite possible. This is going to make life difficult for us, or maybe not. Who knows? But but you know, we want to do a different programming language every two weeks. And if Google buys them all, <laughs> hopefully they won't consolidate them. Like hopefully we'll continue maybe make to. a diversity, get them working on new languages. And yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, definitely. good stuff. Talking about Google, 
Yeah, well, it, actually, one thing, you know, relating to what you were just talking about, it's interesting that patents are becoming more and more of an issue. And Google seems to be getting sued left, right, and center over different patents. They're getting sued over, um, you know, their search, actually, their search engine, which is, you know, not necessarily patent related, but they're getting sued over this patent issue with Sun. And they are in, they're right now the highest bidder on Novell's. Um, um, patent. So basically, Novell is broken apart, and they're selling, you know, different pieces of that of that organization. And Google explicitly is out to buy the patents. And from what I read um, on their blog, they basically they don't necessarily have an interest in the specific patents they're buying. But for them, it's sort of like this cold war where everyone needs to stockpile these nuclear patents, and uh, and uh, you know. Whoever has the most, uh, you know, can kind of threaten boss everyone else around. And Google feels like they're getting kind of bossed around since they're a newer company. So they're trying to, you know, acquire these patents. And there we, really needs to be some serious patent reform. I mean, yeah, I agree. About that? Uh, we need patents are a good thing. I mean, in in general, but when they're improperly applied, it can be disastrous. And I think this is kind of getting there with computer programming and some of the stuff that they got going on in, in computer patents is just some of it's pretty ridiculous and it's going to cause more harm than good. And um, like you said, I agreed the Cold War analogy is fairly apt, I guess, that, you know, mutually assured destruction. So if Google buys up all of Novell's patents, then we'll find something in there to sue anybody who tries to sue them. Exactly. And it's just kind of a go around and around and around. And we're not lawyers, or at least oh, no. I'm not. But yeah, don't take this as uh, legal, yeah, legal advice. advice. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, definitely, I mean, it's an interesting thing. And, and, and lawyers win, right? You know, they get more money to go after more people and file more suits yeah but um hopefully there's some some silver lining for the programmer somewhere that world will be a better place because of all of this yeah i mean but, i've always been a fan of the of course you know this doesn't work in too many companies but but some of companies have adopted a philosophy of sort of catch me if you can you know like they're on the cutting edge and uh they you know this is basically the premise behind uh you know commercial open source is the idea that you put something out in the open and by doing so you take a product and turn it into a standard so like OpenGL for example is a standard versus DirectX which is a product and so Google's done with this with many different technologies the G unit the Google unit test framework for example that's just a framework that they could have tried to market to enterprise companies but now they've published it open source and so many people have jumped on it that it's become a standard and now they are sort of in charge of that and they can kind of mold that and they can uh, also act as an advisor for that you know, in a commercial setting. Um, but yeah, I mean, the patent thing, there's so many people who don't subscribe to that catch me if you can philosophy and want to um, sort of, you know, actually own things that they have researched for an extended amount of time. Yeah, it's hard. I, I see both sides of it, but I mean, I, I think most people agree, even outside of software and technology patents, the patent system is kind of problematic right now, and right. a lot of issues going on there, and you know, uh, well, I guess at some point maybe we can have a longer discussion about this, some, a more intelligent, or maybe get somebody on to, to talk to us a little bit more about the intricacies that, that lie there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's a good idea. So... So my previous transition oh, failed ahead. when I said that, you know, I was uh, and talking about Google. <laughs> we had Google hires inventor Java and Google sponsoring a code jam. What's that? What's a code jam? Yeah. Is so that what's between your fingers when you do a lot of coding? <laughs> That's what's in between like the fingernail. You have sometimes the keys, you know, they start to scratch off oh. and they end up kind of between your fingernail. Or and what the, gets down between the keys when you're eating your sandwich and typing. Yeah, that's right. That's a... Uh, that is definitely code jam. We want to avoid that. But the uh, this particular code jam is actually a programming contest, and so this is uh, this is quite interesting. There's several um, you know contests like this. So for you guys who are still in college or uh, even in high school, they're starting the uh, ACM, which is the Association of Computing and Machinery, is uh, hosts uh, collegiate programming challenge, and so it starts at the um, um, <clears throat> starts at the, uh, I guess, the regional level. So the Southeast United States is one region. Uh, North Africa, I believe, is a region. It, basically, the entire world is divided according to population. And um, if you do well in your region, you can move on to the intercontinental um, programming challenge where they try to find the best programmers in the world at the collegiate level. Um, there is Top Coder, which is, uh, you know, another competition for... Uh, 
um, you know, trying to test your metal against other programmers. And uh, this is, you know, yet a third one, the Google Code Jam. Um, this one's particularly exciting. It comes around once a year. Um, there's many different puzzles, um, you know, at all different levels. And uh, they, uh, some of the prizes um, get serious. I mean, they have a $10,000 top prize, just cash. Nice. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you could also bet that Google will be, you know, sort of interested in the people who win and yeah. and, and, follow, and is going to try to follow them, you know, throughout their career. So is this open to uh, just regular working people or, or just to college students? Oh, good point. Yeah, so I believe... The Google Code Jam is open to everyone. Um, yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> according to uh, according to Google, um, if you are uh, the code version of a ninja trying to master your grappling hook, or a chess grandmaster, or a Taoist philosopher, uh, explaining the deep truths of the world to your followers, if you're like that, but a co- but on the coding plane, um, wow. you know. So I guess that extends to everybody. Nice. Um, you can participate in this. And, you know, Patrick and I have both done programming competitions uh, in college, and I've continued on, you know, judging and writing problems and things like that. And I can tell you it's a lot of fun. It's a great way to meet um, some extremely talented people and also to sort of, uh, you know, hone your skills and, and to, to learn, uh, you know, more about programming. And it's a nice slice of humble pie. Yeah, definitely. There's unless, there's unless you're that one person better. who's just awesome and amazing, and we all envy you and wish we were you. And you do really well at everything you do. Um, <laughs> yeah, you'll probably end up eating a big slice of humble pie when you think your ninja amazing, awesome stealth skills and show up on one of these things and get smacked down by the you know seventeen, eighteen year old kid who's just a programming rock star. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's people who just have extraordinary talent and. Uh, you know, we just, but I think that, you know, everybody, regardless of, you know, neither of us are uh, are that level and uh, probably many of you at home aren't best of the best, but, uh, you know, you could always improve and get better. Definitely, I, definitely. Take it as a challenge. Rise yeah. to the occasion and say, I'm going to learn and get better and show them who's boss. That's right. Yeah. I we mean, might not do three on three basketball down the street, but. <laughs> That's right. You could do some coding ninja. <laughs> you can go baseline, take it to the hoop with your C++ and Python and the different things that, that uh, you've learned on the show. And <clears throat> one other thing, too, is just the um, – I feel like a big part of it is being able to just write code quickly. I mean, that is one of those things, you know, often – you know, many of us work 40-hour-a-week jobs and uh, – we have you know the luxury of spending a day kind of thinking about how we're going to tackle a problem and often the things we work on take months so they require you know an architecture but this is a unique opportunity where someone gives you 15 minutes to write something that you know you're just going to throw away you know in an hour or so once it's done and just being able to consolidate your thoughts and just put them out in the code that is just a really awesome skill to have and it's a lot of fun to to execute yeah definitely i think there's a balance there getting code done fast and getting it done right yeah it's good to make sure you have both sides of that coin yeah definitely Definitely. that's good so i guess uh do you have i think you have some news on facebook oh yeah so um Saw the last couple of days that Facebook open sourced its server architecture, its data center, how it does. So all of these big web companies serve up, you know, I guess millions, billions of pages a day, you know, and, and it takes a lot of uh, big iron workstations. So I guess big iron is uh, mainframes and stuff. So it's a wrong term there. But a lot of very large servers and yeah. very big data centers to to do the kind of processing that they need to be able to provide the services that are, you know, their their bread and butter. And um, so there's a lot of black magic, you know, trade secrets that go into exactly how you do stuff because little things become a big deal. So Yeah, just, um, just to put it in perspective, I have the Facebook statistics up. So that they have more than 500 million active users. So, uh, and then it says 50% of our active users log into Facebook in any given day. So think about that. In one day... 250 million different people go to Facebook and do something, you know, different. You know, at least they're, they're going to look at their own page, which is completely different, almost entirely. And then, you know, they might do some things that are shared. But for the most part, they're all, you know, creating content, looking at content of people in their neighborhood. And, and that the magnitude of the amount of data and the amount of information that they have to um, 
of yeah, capacities. Yeah, and, and different than even a Google search or serving up a static web page or you know uh, just a regular web blog or something. I mean, Facebook has a lot of rights to their databases and to their mm -hmm. things, and that's a, a whole different architecture and, and art that goes on to that. So these data centers, they have you know things that, that normally we take for granted, like how close you are to a power generation plant. So they try to locate a lot of these next to really cheap sources of power because it makes a big difference. So in cities with large hydroelectric dams and stuff like that, that allows them to, to, to get the energy really cheap. Um, and even cutting unnecessary things out of their motherboards and off their process, uh, off their you know, server racks that aren't needed to save that last little you know, few watts of power makes a big difference when you're talking you know, thousands upon thousands of machines you know, running and keeping them cool. So they, I was reading, they don't use uh, air conditioning like normal. They use a, this, this spray of a mist of water that evaporates and the evaporation makes the air cooler. And then they blow air through that and use that to do the cooling for these data centers. And it's very interesting. And Facebook, I guess, has been talking about that. They even use the heat that's generated in the server room to heat the other parts of their building during the cooler months. So they don't have to run heaters and stuff. Um, and so uh, these server rooms can get pretty hot, all this energy going in, it can be expensive. So anything they can do to save money, to save power, which ends up leading to money, to do things faster, do more with less is, is a good thing. And so people are, are you know, kind of saying, well, why did Facebook open source this? If it's so proprietary, if it's so important to how they do things, you know, what's the incentive there to open source that? And um, so there's speculation of bounds. Of course, one is just to give back. So a lot of these websites, you know, at least start off on open source stacks of software. So some people are trying to say, well, maybe they're, you know, just trying to put that in the hardware and say, let's open source this. Another Jason pointed out earlier in his talk about patents is that if Facebook can release kind of an open open book on how to do data centers and they can get other people who are small like them. So I think Facebook currently um, is some, some you know, tenth the size of um, Google in terms of money and earnings and stuff. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact number. I'm probably completely off on that. But they, they, you know, they're not as big or as established as Google. So Google's had time to go build all of their web servers up and get everything together and, and have it made their way. Facebook's kind of trying to move more aggressively and doesn't have that uh, inertia behind it to get that stuff done. So one way they can outmaneuver the other guys, Microsoft and Google and, and Twitter and whoever, right, is to say, like, hey, let's open source this. Let's get people to cooperate with us. And then they, you know, become help define the standard and they win in the end because they're helping others and then other people contribute back and give new ideas and bring more to the party. And as a group, multiple companies work together to make a bigger entity than their enemies, basically. Well, yeah, I mean, actual enemies, but it's sort of it's really interesting because it's sort of the inverse of what traditionally happens, which is, uh, let's say, uh, Linksys, for example. So Linksys wants to sell the router. They want to sell the hardware and they'll, um, you know, give you the firmware updates and all the software um, you know, updates for free because they want to sell this piece of equipment. And as we move more to a sort of service-oriented industry, uh, you know, we're going to find exactly the opposite of that, where um, you know the hardware and the actual infrastructure doesn't really matter, and they can give all of those secrets away for free. Uh, but what is important is the service that they're providing and the user base. Yeah, it's interesting. It's a, it's a new approach, and I, I like the kind of open source this stuff. This is interesting, and putting that into new areas. Another thing, a little off topic, but um, some open source electronics that, that are interesting, like hobby electronics. So mm -hmm. um, there's like the Arduino, or yep. um, some other people who do kind of open embedded devices. Beagle board. The Beagle board. There's another one, the Panda board. Um, those gum are by, sticks. By TI. Uh, is, I don't know if the gum sticks is how open are they? They use yeah. Angstrom. Linux. Okay, so yeah. running it, but um, even to the point of some of these, like the, the BeagleBoard and the Arduino are open source, like the actual, you know, they'll give you all the stuff necessary to make your own boards if you want. Oh, like to. the pin layout. Like the pins layout, the PCB oh. screens, whatever. You know, I'm getting way outside of my area of expertise there. But this is a really interesting thing because in the past, that's how you make it, right? Yeah. So, you know, people might say, well, we'll release the open source to this, but it's not really necessarily all that valuable. But these guys are releasing everything. So if you wanted, you could just do it the same. I think they still protect some things, like you can't call it an Arduino if you don't have permission from them or whatever, just so that the idea is being that people don't make inferior products or cut corners or do stuff wrong and then still be able to use the name. But yeah, they kind of release everything and make it, it gets better because of that. You build up a community around it and then, you know, it, it's able to be better than if you spent time and effort on your own. And so it's, uh, plus you get goodwill 
um, from yeah. the community at large, people who say, oh, we like that you do this. This is a good idea, right? And so then they kind of like you, they buy it from you, they support you, uh, even though financially it doesn't make a lot of sense because somebody else could do it and do it cheaper, but they want to go to you because you did this, like you did something awesome and nice. Right, and the community is a really important word because you know, really, ultimately, that's what um, Facebook is all about. Is It's about the fact that they have this gigantic user base, is 250 million users a day. And even if they the source code to Facebook, say, got leaked out, um, you wouldn't see just, you know, 10 Facebooks pop up with 500 million users. I mean, they have, like, dominated that community. And as long as they're providing good service, there's just, um, there's so much momentum there. And so by open sourcing something, you can generate a lot of excitement. I mean, everyone wants to try something if it's free. And uh, if they think that they can make it better, even more so. And so you can establish yourself as sort of like a dominant figure in, you know, Technique X. So if you're out there and you um, are really into, you know, I don't know, <laughs> like automatic autonomous fishing. <laughs> I'm just making something up. And not the pH fishing, but actual fishing, like with a robot arm. Then uh, a rod and reel, yeah, and that's real right. water, yeah, not like and real sun outside, no grandma credit card numbers or anything. Oh. <laughs> but uh, you know, you could you know open source all your autonomous robot fishing software, and then you could be sort of on top of the world there. And that the robot fishing king, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that could sort of carry you through. That you know, you could make money by just being the authority in that area. Interesting, doing consulting and doing, right. doing other that's stuff, right. yeah making appearances because of your pure awesomeness. Yeah, and then you have to, you can invent the, uh, you know, phishing language, and then Google will hire you. And then to, we'll talk about you. Yeah. Oh, man, this is great. We need this, is, to, this is good. We need to get someone who knows how to fish. <laughs> <laughs> get that, ladies and gentlemen, get yeah. that started. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Oh, before I forget, we have some reviews in iTunes, or at that's least right. one we know about. And uh, so... I, Oh, the username. Let's give him a shout yeah, out. Yeah, let me Go see. Ahead, open let it up. Find it. Let's fire it up. Let's uh, let's give him a thank. Somebody somebody wrote us a nice review, and uh, um, we've gotten some comments before on our blog. Now we're getting some reviews on iTunes. Thank you guys for doing that. Um, we recently checked how many downloads did we have of our first two episodes? We had 152. 152. That's nice, but I think we can do better. Come on, team. Share it with your friends. Tell about the awesomeness that is Programming Throwdown. Yeah. And uh, we'll see if we can't get these numbers to go up a little to you know make make this show kind of a, a cool thing we like we like it we enjoy it i think we're having a good time and i hope you guys are too so you know rise let us know if you like it tell us what you would like to see hear about topics languages you'd like to cover maybe you've invented a language you know let us know and uh you know we're just interested to hear from you guys and you know talking about open source and community you know i i guess it's a goal but we like to be able to make this kind of a community thing and you know have feedback from our fans and from you know not be just about jason and i but about the community at large it'd be kind of cool you know yeah be a part of that and if you guys have any requests for any particular languages or anything you're interested in if you want to sort of change the format or if you want to if you if you are really an expert on a particular language and uh, would like to chime in and be a guest host or something like that, you know, uh, feel free to shoot us uh, shoot us an email at programmingthrowdown at gmail .com and give us your feedback. Yeah, or if you uh, don't like what we say and you want to have a debate on the air so we can tell you how awesome we are and throw it down. <laughs> That, that'd be good, you know, if you don't like the way Jason sounds and you think we should vote him off the show. No, no. No, <laughs> uh, no I'm just teasing. We love you, Jason. Oh, thanks, man. So, um, okay, we got it. It's DefTO, D-E-F-T-E-O. So uh, thanks for uh, thanks for the love. He says, love the podcast. Explanation? Oh, just one explanation point. I thought there was multiple ones. Oh, that was a fake out. I thought there was right. two. I got excited. Two exclamation that's right. points. No, you know what? This is radio. There's four exclamation <laughs> oh, points. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and if you see anything different, that's because it got edited between now and yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. I think he's editing it right now, actually, and making it one. Oh, no. We're that's going okay. down in exclamation marks. That's all right. But before he does that, he's going to make it eight. So, anyways, if you guys like the podcast, definitely uh, you know, give us some feedback. We really appreciate it. Um, you, you can post on the blog. You can post within iTunes. Um, so uh, that's all good stuff. All right. So tool of the bye week, Jason. Tool of the bye week. So my tool is Microsoft Dependency Walker. And Is this uh, like an old person walker? <laughs> like the thing with the tennis balls on the bottom? 
it it does. There are tennis balls, but they're the kind of tennis balls you want to throw at your computer, uh, and they're Ooh. bricks. <laughs> um, playing tennis with bricks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You usually uh, when you feel like playing tennis with bricks or just running your head into a brick wall, uh, that's a time when you know it's time to break out Microsoft Dependency Walker. Because okay. All right. DLLs are are uh, you know there's the common phrase DLL hell, which originated from you know Windows 98 and just the disaster it was back then, and it's gotten a little better, but not substantial. So, this is the magic of Dependency Walker. Uh, if you ever run a program and it says you know error uh, this function not found in opengl.dll or error you know direct 3d function not called something very bizarre one of these you know message box pop-ups that that uh, happens like before your program even starts running um, this is probably because of a bad dll on your machine uh, especially if this is a program that you downloaded some program someone else made uh, like a game or some app that you assume has been tested by the by the by the person who you bought it from um, you know you could assume that it's probably something on your computer it becomes very difficult then to isolate that so how do you know uh, what version of opengl.dll you have or uh, you know what version you need or where that file actually is on your computer because it could be anywhere in your path so what dependency walker does is you give it an executable and it goes through and starts to load the executable. And every time the exe asks for a DLL, it uh, goes through and recursively, you know, puts that DLL in this list and then asks the DLL, hey, what, what DLLs do you need? And it keeps tracing down. It builds this tree structure of all these DLLs with the version number and uh, the functions. And if any of the functions are like mismatched or wrong, it'll tell you exactly which ones and where they are. And this becomes really important when you get those just absolutely bizarre errors in, in the at the at the startup of your application. No, we do never get bizarre errors on Windows. <laughs> I don't I that never happens. <laughs> never. Yeah, really, you know, you get just the weirdest errors on every OS uh, on startup. You know, like you know, let's say you're running Excel and you know you're editing some graph and you cause something crazy to happen, you try to edit too much data, or you find some bug in Excel, it'll usually crash and it'll have some nice, you know, send this report to Microsoft, or, you know, Firefox crashes, it has this whole bug system that goes across the internet. But if something crashes in the beginning, like on startup, yeah, you get nothing. It's like that error negative one that you, you get on your Apple II or whatever. I mean, it's just brutal and, and it seems hopeless. Your computer has dysentery. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Oh no! All so, right, I, I just I just derailed Jason now. So he's rolling on the floor, when literally. When your when your computer has serious like intestinal problems, you bust out this dependency walker. Pepto bismol. Uh, that's right. Oh, dependency walker is the pepto bismol for your DLL needs. <laughs> yeah, when it it takes the dump out of DLL for sure. I I think that you know one of the important things too, with dependency walker is. Letting you know um, when you have things installed in non-standard locations. So sometimes you'll install a game and uh, you'll turn, restart your computer, and something will be fundamentally wrong with you know your entire computer. Like your Aero desktop won't work, or your something very bizarre will happen. It's good to run that dependency walker and realize, oh, you know, it installed this OpenGL.dll, and now Windows itself wants to use this crazy DLL instead of the original, and it helps you sort through all those hard-to-fix problems. Yeah, it sounds like something definitely to have there. Not no everyday tool, but definitely something to have at your disposal for those uh, really sticky, annoying situations. Yep. Good pick, good pick. Yeah, and one last part on Dependency Walker is if you're writing applications, so you're on the other end of it, you're a developer and you want to make an application that's not going to throw up when it runs on someone else's computer. Which is a good thing to have as a goal. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to spread dysentery. You don't want code jam all over everybody else's computers. That's right. So you can run Dependency Walker on an EXE you made and it'll return and say, hey, uh, you know, you, this EXE you made, it needs, you know, this version of OpenGL and it needs DirectX 2011.dll. So you can infer, oh, you know, if I give this to somebody and he hasn't updated his DirectX in a year, that it's not going to work. And so you can really get a handle on 
how to deploy software using this program. Nice. So what does it do if it errors and says, you know, I need DirectX 2013? Right. So if you, uh, you know, if we went to the uh, went with Patrick to the future where he bought this microphone and used DirectX 13, um, brought it back to the present and ran dependency walker on it, um, it would, you know, try to match up the current version of DirectX. But if there was some function that didn't exist in DirectX 2011, um, or if it just couldn't match them because the names weren't, they changed the name of the DLL or something like that. Um, it'll actually point at the specific function of the specific file it's interesting. missing. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. So it doesn't make any recommendations though about how to fix it. No. It's it, a little lower level than that. It'll make like high level recommendations like you're missing this, this DLL file or this DLL file is missing this particular function. And, um, you know, from there, you know, you can, even without knowing what that function does, at a high level, you can say, you know, directx.dll is missing a function. Let me update my directx. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Reinstall. Yeah, that's right. Or just download the latest yeah, Windows updates or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Nicely done. Cool. All right. So what's your tool of the bye week? My tool of the bye week is KeePass, spelled K E E pass and we'll uh, put that in the show notes so is this that thing that you needed to use to uh, go to the bathroom without getting detention in in elementary school or was that no, that's a p pass oh that's p oh, okay i don't know i we didn't have to have one of those at my school that's Actually, pretty intense we had a this is no joke a fully sized like real toilet seat and uh and you had to carry the you know unused hopefully unused toilet seat with you uh into the bathroom you know because there wasn't one there like no no you there had to was bring your own toilet seat oh no no, no. there was a toilet seat BYOT's there. Ass? <laughs> <laughs> you brought the it's basically if you're walking in the hall with a toilet seat no one questioned you like it was assumed that you were going to the bathroom so so well, each wow. classroom okay. had a actually only i think just the history teachers were in on this but each history teacher had a toilet seat under their desk and if you needed to use the bathroom, they and it had a chain, so you could hold it without having to touch the seat. So you had to be handcuffed to the toilet seat. <laughs> That's right. So if you were willing to be handcuffed to the toilet seat, you could avoid wetting yourself in history class. Wow, this is wow, this is pretty intense, man. I, I got to think about this for a minute. <laughs> yeah, this, this no, is no, this is this is not. I thought this was maybe going somewhere else, and we were going to lose our clean tag. But okay. Oh no. Uh, no, no, no. So yeah, all right. Uh, wait, no, this has nothing to do with toilets, <laughs> unless. There's no less here, unless you are awesome and you put a passcode on your bathroom. Oh, I've seen those. To prevent those. Unauth- unauthorized usage by, uh, you know, maybe if you live with your, your family or siblings, or maybe if you're still in high school or whatever, you know, maybe it would be a good thing to put a, a lock on yeah. the bathroom so you could control access to it. That'd be good. That'd I've, be good I've seen those really, have you seen those really fancy toilets in Japan? Like they have ones that have video games built in. They have ones that oh, all sorts no. of, cra- maybe there's one this out there circling the that needs a key pass. <laughs> okay. We are completely right. making anybody who Back contributes to the key pass project really upset at us right now. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, man. All right. So KeePass is an open source project. Man, we can't do these live together anymore. This is just, <laughs> this is just not good. All right. Um, the KeePass project is an open source project to do um, being a, a, basically a password vault. So we all know, come on, let's be honest. You don't make the best passwords ever. You know, um, people think they do. You don't. And you know you're using the same one for 20,000 different things. So instead of doing that, you know, one option, right? And a lot of people discourage this at work, you know, and even at home, it's, it's definitely a bad idea to write your password down. And, but what if you, the, the trade off there is if you write your password down, you're not going to forget it. So you can make it really secure so that somebody would actually have to break into your house before they'd be able to get your passwords. Um, but this is kind of gives you the best of that world of being able to have really secure passwords that have to be written down because they're so complicated and the ability to not worry about somebody breaking in. And that is basically you create one really nice ultra secure password to lock up what amounts to kind of like a vault, a file that's gonna store all your other passwords. So you make one really, really good one, and then you go in there and it's able to create, you know, accounts and usernames and passwords. And it'll auto-generate it and you can even set the rules because, you know, different websites have different rules. You can set them to like, no, I, I think they can even set them to like notify you that it's gonna expire or something. Mm-hmm. So it'll ha- have you change them. So if you wanted to, you know, for instance, Gmail never has your password expire, but it's probably a good idea to change your password every so often. So you have KeePass alert you 
that your password needs to be changed. And it does some cool features. Um, at least I, I don't have it, I don't think it's Windows only, but I'm not really sure on that. But I know on, on Windows it'll do something really nice where like if you right click on an once you unlock your vault. And they have offer all sorts of very nice options for authentication in and, and multi-factor authentication to get in. But um, if you unlock your vault and you have your username and password, you can right click and copy your username on like an entry or right click and say copy your password, then be able to paste it. And then after a few moments, it'll actually go back and, and overwrite your password in memory, get rid of it so that, you know, it doesn't stay in your keyboard to be, you know, gotten by other other things hmm. later. Um, so that's kind of a really nice feature. And then you can close it when you're done. Um, and again, you know, it, it's it's pretty useful. What I use it for is those, you know, those websites you, and it's really good when you create a website that you know you're not going to remember the username and password for. And it's like something really silly that you don't care if it gets broken into, but they require you to have a 10 digit password with a special character, uppercase, lowercase, numerical values, and you know, all this stuff. And then you, you know you're going to forget it. And so what you do is you can go ahead and just create an entry in here, have it auto-generate it for you, and then just paste it in. And then you won't forget it. You know, it'll just be there. And then you can uh, back it up to, for instance, a Dropbox or to a USB stick. And um, my intention, I haven't done this yet, but I still plan to, is to share this between my wife and I so that, you know, if something were to happen to me or to her, you know, I'd want her to be able to get into my stuff. And, you know, everybody's got their own little quirks and differences between how they handle sharing passwords between husband and wife. But, um, you know, certain things I would like my wife to be able to get at if, if something happened to me or if she needed to take care of yeah. something or if I'm on travel and she needs to you know help me out with something so you know if, if she has the password and, and shares a file with me and we keep it up to date then you know she'll be able to get at my stuff and um, and find it and that's a, a good way to keep it secure and, and not have to share it you know in the open so, so how does this work so you have your master key yep your master and, key and you know you go to a website let's say I go to foo.com right. and foo.com says I want you to create a username and password yep so what do you do from there? So there, there are ones that are more automated, but they typically tend to be integrated in with your browser, which of course becomes a problem if you're on multiple computers or you know if you use like me, I, I use a ton of different browsers just to switch it up. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, but what you do is so you go there, right? And then you say, oh, I got to create a username and password. So my workflow is then I'll go start up KeyPass. I'll type in my master password, which is nice and secure. And no, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> and uh, then what it does is I can right click in it or go to an option, basically say create new entry. Tell the website name so like you know foo.com tell it my username i want so patrick and then um what i do is i can have it generate a password for me and i have just default rules it's you know really nice long password that you know whatever uh, or you can just type in your own password and then save it and it'll remember the entry for you so then later instead of having to do the password recovery for this website you go to once every three years or whatever you can just go back to keypass and, and look it up Oh, I see. So, so now you come back the next day and you want to log into foo.com. So you put foo.com in a key pass and hit, you know, recall or something. I yeah, guess. well, it just has a list. Yeah, it has a list of all the entries you have. Okay. You might be able to search or you can categorize them. And, you know, it's pretty flexible. And, yeah, you basically can just right click on the entry and say copy username, copy password. Or you can open it up and, you know, unmask the password, have it show you what the password is or, you know, a variety of different things there. It's pretty flexible and I find it to be very nice. Mm. And it's open source. So the idea is that it's been looked at by a lot of people and should right. be secure. It's not going to steal your password. Passwords, and it's free. Yeah. Um, there are other ones that you have to pay for, um, but I like this one because open source. So you know, hopefully, people have checked this out and made sure that it's you know really nice and secure, and they're not making bad assumptions or you know going to let your passwords leak out, especially if you're going to put all your passwords in. And I still. As much as I should trust, I don't necessarily trust it for things like, you know, that like my bank login and password. I, I tend right. to just try to memorize. Yep. But for a lot of other stuff that isn't as important, but still is kind of important, you know, I, I think it's a good good thing to use. Well, so are there, does KeePass have a browser plugin where it would like autocomplete or anything like that? Um, I don't know. Okay. Oh, I, I'll I, check it out. Yeah, it might have some integration. I, the way I use it, 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 I don't. Maybe it would though. That would be very powerful, I guess. Would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Just guessing, throwing stuff in the dark. Maybe we should submit it on their feedback box or something. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. So you said it's open source. It's open source, so we could contribute it. That's right. I mean, we can we can go in and do that. It wouldn't be bad at all. But yeah, so that's uh that's my tool of the bye week, is KeePass. Check it out. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah, and it looks like it looks like there is a at least a Firefox extension for KeePass. Oh, nice. So, yeah, it's good stuff. Cool. All right, so time for our programming language of the bye week. That's right. That's right. So this time we're doing Erlang. That's fun to say. Erlang. Erlang. Oh, it should be py 
pirates use R lang. <laughs> I think pirates just use R. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's a statistics language. Yeah, um, pirates. Well, you know, they have to divvy up all the booty, and there's probably like 200 oh, people I have to get a share. So. Interesting, interesting. Nice. Yeah. Okay, but. I, I think um, Erlang is more from that song where everybody wants cake on their birthday. I think that's that's really where it was, right? Wow. Is that right? Is that the history of Erlang? I, I don't think so. Oh. So I think the history of Erlang is uh, the way it goes down, is I guess a lot of these things are it's shrouded in mystery. Uh, or just forgotten. But no, no, so seriously, I guess uh, Erlang is supposed to stand for Ericsson language. Right. It was developed right. by Ericsson, the telecommunications company, and it gets its roots there in doing um, telecommunications type software. So think, uh, you know, like packet switching routers and, and that kind of interesting fun stuff, which is, you know, very high bandwidth, very, you know, necessary for fault tolerance. You know, you're going to, you know, try to be doing tons and tons of things all at once and, you know, do it as minimal amount of hardware as you have to and um so in, in that way it kind of led to a lot of the requirements that were used to to make it what it is which is a highly uh, concurrency oriented functional programming language mm -hmm. um that's just recently seems to be picking up a lot of steam i guess it's been around i, I I'm, without it up in front of me i think 1999 um, and um, 1986. 19, oh, when it wow. appeared. I was, I was shocking. Yeah, do you know the interesting thing? The reason oh, it was why released at open source as 1998. Sorry, oh, that's I see. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah, go the ahead. reason why Erlang is more popular now is because um, in 2006 they added multi processing support. So basically, what, what Erlang does now is um, essentially, we'll talk about this more, you know, as we as we start talking about the language. But uh, in the past, it was broken up into several different, you know, when you write your program, it's broken up into several different pieces. Um, but all these pieces just ran one at a time in sort of a queue, like asynchronously, but uh, but just but just one at a time. And uh, in 2006, they added multi-processing support, where um, several uh, different pieces of your code could run at the same time, and uh, that made Erlang uh, an extremely powerful language when it came to running on these multi-core and many-core machines that we have today. Interesting, interesting. So, functional programming language. We talked about C and Python so far. Those are both imperative languages. Mm -hmm. Erlang is a functional language. So, so what it Oh, we could spend forever talking about this, but in short, you know, one or two sentences, what's a functional programming language? Yeah, so I guess, you know, the simple way of, of uh, explaining it is um, if you're familiar to C or C++ or Python or Java or many of the languages that we've discussed on the podcast before, you're used to sort of the, you know, the, I guess the commands or the programming end of it or the, you know, the logic and the data. So... The idea is that you have, you know, you know, some global memory with you know, your classes and your, uh, you know, your structs and your arrays and things like that. And then you have functions which, um, you know, go through call other functions or just are in some kind of some kind of a while true going on in your main loop. And um, they uh, they're acting on that data. So functional programming is very is a very different model. And functional programming, you don't really have data just sitting out there to be accessed. Um, but <clears throat> each function uh, passes in data. So in other words, your main function gets passed in the command line arguments. That's true even of C++. Um, but there's no global memory. That's it. That's all you get. And then you can, uh, you know, create some things inside of that main function and pass those to other functions. But it's not like there's data just sitting out there waiting to be utilized. Um, so that's really the thing that separates functional programming from the more data-driven languages like C and, and Python. So, yeah, I mean, I guess it has a lot of implications for Erlang being so concurrent and, and you know, the, a lot of the problems that creep up in traditional, you know, with quotes there that you can't see because you're listening on the radio. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the traditional languages there, you know, have problems with the, the data that's hanging around and you're able to access it and make changes and that causes race conditions and, and, you know, problems with needing mutexes all over the place and controlling how and who can access stuff so that you don't end up modifying different things from different places and not and getting unintended results because you're trying to do multiple things at once. Right. Like in, in C++, to use some example, um, 
let's say let's say you're making uh, I don't know some kind of football game uh, you know American football game and you have players running around you have a quarterback a football a stadium these are all classes in your in your C++ um, um, in your architecture so you know one of the football players his position might be affected as a result of one of the other players he might get tackled or he might get bumped and that might move his position uh, his position might also be affected by himself he might be running and that might be causing his position to change so you know in c plus plus you can never really be sure um you know especially in a multi-processing environment that um, your position that no one else is bumping you and modifying your position. You know that that information is out there up for grabs, and uh, you know you can you know you can structure C plus plus like you said using mutexes and semaphores and things like that to uh, and, and message passing. Uh, you know, sort of restrict it and say, look, if you want to alter my position, you have to tell me, and I'm going to actually be the one you know mutating the position. You can just give me hints, um, but Ultimately, you know, you're dealing with, uh, you know, at the low level like C and C++, you're dealing with just bits and bytes and there's nothing stopping someone else from going in and, and doing whatever they want with, with, uh, with your data. So Erlang, by contrast, doesn't have data just sitting out there. Everything is part of a function. It's either a parameter to a function or it was created inside of a function. And as you pass data from one function to the other, um, you actually, you know, capsulize the data into a message and pass that message. Message passing. Yep. Message passing is 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 what Erlang's all about. So you call a function with two uh, as a parameter. What it actually does is, you know, puts two in an envelope, sends it over to that function. An actual envelope. That's right. An actual envelope. Nice. Actually, what it does is it sends the number two. So they're the people still sending mail in the post office. <laughs> That's right. It sends a number two with a toilet seat attached to his <laughs> wrist oh, over no. to your function. Where Too much he, potty uh, humor. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> where, he, uh, where that function can then be waiting for him. So this, this is also called uh, the actor model. So do you want to yeah, try and give that a shot? So, what do you so know the about actor that? model, right? So this is a... There's all sorts of ways to deal with concurrency and, and, you know, what amounts to shared state. So if you try to, and Jason was trying to get this, you know, with the description of the football players, but anytime you try to share state between multiple processes that need to, you know, both read and modify. So one way is to deal, you know, and you learn about this in, in textbooks and stuff, but producer consumer. So if you got one, but some, somebody producing something and only one other person consuming it, world is happy, or at least, you know, straightforward. But when you end up with multiple producers and multiple consumers and, you know, consumers can also produce and producers can also consume, things get, you know, more hairy and uh, it becomes a little harder to deal with that shared state. And the more shared state you have, the more chance you have to mess something up and not be careful enough. Mm -hmm. um, and so what the actor model says is instead of allowing shared state, we're basically going to forbid it. And that's going to cause some interesting implications, both good and bad, um, in that if you don't share state, shared state is really fast. This is basically you just access memory like it's yours, um, and everybody does the same. And so that's really fast, um, but it's dangerous. So what the actor model says, if let's get rid of that, and let's basically say the only way to talk to another piece of code is through a mailbox, like you were talking about, and sending a message to it. And then it can determine when it wants to talk about that message, how it wants to handle it, and then what it wants to do. And so actors, you know, basically boil down to really simply, they're able to receive messages, handle the responses locally, generate other messages, uh, generate other actors, um, and then that's kind of pretty much it. They're not really affecting state, at least not a shared state. Um, and so you're able to kind of have, you need a little more clever planning, but you're able to worry less about the multi-processing, multiple threads, concurrent states of your stuff because you've kind of encapsulated in this way and very much defined the interactions in a way that um, eliminate, if you can get your stuff to fit that paradigm, kind of eliminate the worry about having a lot of the issues that are common with other ways of doing concurrent programming. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, sometimes you would think as people have been doing a lot of programming in C and C++, you'll kind of have this thought experiment where you'll say to yourself, you know, life would be so easy if all of my classes were just, you know, a map of, of uh, strings to, you know, different data. So in other words, 
Uh, you know, if my class, if I could actually get at the different members of the class, if I could say, instead of saying, you know, my class dot x equals 3, my class dot y equals 4, if I could just say, like, everything in my class is 3, or both things are 3. If you could do things on, like, a programmatic perspective. And so, uh, you know, Python kind of does that in the sense that, like, classes are really dictionaries in Python. And so it kind of is an extrapolation of that thought experiment. Um, so going back to Erlang, you know, it's sort of the idea where, you know, in C++ we have all these different classes and the classes are good at, you know, representing different data. So, you know, my football player class has my football player's location and that's very modular in the sense that the, the uh, football class only has the football's location. It doesn't have the player's locations in it as well. So that keeps it very compartmentalized. But the logic can, C++ really lets you go wild with the logic, or in a lot of these imperative languages. Like you could have the football player movement in the football class because you just have access to all this data. So Erlang is sort of, you know, sort of taking the other approach, taking it all the way to the extreme where it's like, what if everyone had their own data and their own logic and operated independently. You know, what does that mean? You know, if we extrapolate that, if we take that all the way to the extreme, uh, you know, how does that change our way of thinking and how does that change the kind of programs we write? Yeah, it's. I think it's going to become more and more important to, to have these alternative tools in the toolbox mm -hmm. as we move to a more multi-processor future. Right, that's, that's an excellent point. I mean, a big problem right now is being able to do concurrent programming, being able to run two things at the same time. And it's because the logic can so easily get conflated. You know, if the football is modifying the football player's positions and they're modifying their own positions, now you have, as Patrick mentioned, a race condition where you have two things modifying the same data at the same time. And uh, that causes very unpredictable results. I mean, you might be assuming that your position isn't changing in this one function where you calculate something based on position. And all of a sudden, in the middle of that function, it changes. And uh, that causes your program to act in a way that you didn't expect and causes crashes and things like that. So rather than have to sort of dwell on these things and try and compartmentalize everything yourself and possibly screw it up, you know, we can use something like Erlang where it's a little bit more strict on the logic and sort of, it, you know, forces you to think a certain way. So forcing you to think this different way, uh, we uh, look for some links for you guys for learning Erlang. So, yeah, uh, so. we found this uh, awesome, awesome website. We, it's uh, learn you some Erlang for great good. <laughs> That's right. It's learn you some Erlang dot com is the is the domain name. How do you how do you like their little mascot there, the little logo? It, it was pretty epic. Yeah, you guys should definitely check out the uh, the front page of that. I think it's a it's a squid who's using what eight eight different computers at the same time or something. Well, it's also reading the book about itself. Oh, that's awesome. You know, if he was on the cover of the book, it could be you know recursive, but it's not. No, sadly. I guess he's just reading about Erlang. Yeah, but. One of the last, one other thing about Erlang. Oh, sorry. Yep, go ahead. Is uh, so you know you have these different um, objects, and one thing that you know we didn't completely you know cement this idea, but because you know we've separated the logic and we've separated the data into all these different objects, they're all able to run at the same time, mm -hmm. and that's really what gives Erlang the concurrency. You know, the football player is able to update his position and do his AI and his calculations and whatever. And the football is able to do the projectile motion as it's being thrown independently without you as a programmer saying, all right, you guys can both run at the same time. You know, the system does that for you. It automatically knows what things can run at the same time and it runs them all at the same time. That's what gives uh, Erlang such a great performance uh, in this multi-core world. Yeah. So, um, we talk about libraries. Um, the I guess the standard library equivalent for Erlang is called the OTP. Yep. So sometimes you'll see this even if the if you go look to download Erlang, it'll be the Erlang o and Erlang, like Erlang slash OTP or something. And what OTP stands for is Open Telecom Platform, and that's the open source library that includes a lot of the common things you'd want to do and, and want to use. And so that's kind of like the included part, the batteries, as it were, for like we talked about last week for Erlang that they, they give it. Um, able to do stuff more than just the basic necessities. Do people use Erlang for stuff besides just uh, telecommunications? 
Um, yeah, so I think Erlang is used in CouchDB, right? The, yeah, uh, yeah. The NoSQL database. Um, I believe it's also used in Wings 3D, which is a 3D modeling tool. Yep. Uh, do you have any? Uh, yeah, um, RabbitMQ, which is an implementation of the, oh, I'm going to say AMQP, the um, protocol for message passing. So right there, getting back to its telecom roots, but able to do really fast, really reliable, fault tolerant, um, message passing so amqp is it i get get huh. the order right yeah you did yeah so it's, um, it's an implementation of that so um it's used and this will parlay into the next where it's used but um able to do really high numbers of message passing and routing and they use this we've talked about a couple of times with the high frequency trading guys and finance oh, guys right. use that and uh that they, we talked was it last time about the guy who stole code from goldman sachs yeah that's right actually stole erlang code is the thing there or i guess <laughs> nice. alleged right i don't know what the result of that is i think he went to jail so I think oh he went to jail convicted. yeah we did say that yeah so so convicted so yeah so that was involving erlang code because that's part of their high frequency trading stuff um, so yeah, I mean, it's used more than just telecom stuff. So the Goldman Sachs stuff, the you know, 3D modeling, the document store database. I mean, those are kind of things that are a little bit different than just what you would think is message routing. It's also used by, and I, I don't have it on here right in front of me, but the 2600 Hertz project does some um, voice over IP stuff. So think like hmm. Skype replacement slash, if you don't know what asterisk is, which is an open PBX. Um, so kind of doing, oh, and this gets beyond what I understand, but, you know, doing telecommunications voice stuff for, you know, enterprise stuff, but doing it open source and free and able to give people the ability to kind of control their own telephone system. Hmm. And, um, so they use it, which, which fits in with its, you know, nice telecommunications background. Yeah. And so this actually, you know, the, the bigger, the, the more broad point here is that, um, in the end, you can do just about anything in any language. And um, if your uh, frustration tolerance is high enough. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And, uh, and Erlang is no doubt, no, no exception. If, uh, you know, if you go on the Wikipedia site for Erlang or you start reading the tutorials, you'll realize that Erlang is vast, or any functional language, Prolog, Lisp, etc., is vastly different from, um, you know, C, C++, and the imperative languages that you may be used to. And, uh, you know, it might seem like things are impossible. You know, how can you, how can you write a serious, large-scale app without global data? You know, it sounds like an impossible thing, to, a possible task, but um, you would be amazed that, uh, that uh, all it takes is just a shift in, in paradigm and a shift in thinking, and, um, and you can do anything in, in Erlang or any of these languages. And we're big proponents of that. I mean, part of what we're doing here is try to get people to embrace that alternative ways of thinking, even if you don't end up using Erlang in your day-to-day -day job. If you go out and play with it on the weekend, the evenings, and, and you know, find this brain-twisting stuff and make it through it, you're going to learn some new ways to look at problems. And maybe it will apply even, you know, in using C and C++. Maybe you'll look at a new way to, to solve a problem that you've been working on or something that was hard to tackle, and now you got kind of a way to do it. So here's my chance to sort of grill you. You're uh, in the hot seat. No, 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 no. I was trying to avoid this all, all <laughs> podcast long. So what was Erlang first programmed in? I mean, now I'm pretty oh, sure okay. it's in C or something, but what was it in in the beginning? So 19, is this 1986? Right. 1986. Oh, man. Programming history. So... Is it something weird? It's another functional language. Prolog? You got it. Erlang was originally implemented in Prolog, which is... Interesting. Yeah, which which is short for Prologic, I believe, right? Or actually... Well, well it's not much shorter. Short. Than. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's... Let me see here. Blah, 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 blah. Prolog is short for... Uh, I think it is Prologic. All right, well, he looks that up. That That's interesting. So that that's something we haven't really talked about that, you know, if you're going to write a language, you got to write it in something else. Yeah. So you either, you know, I guess assembly, because you could write it in machine code, you know, directly if you've had a high frustration tolerance and, <laughs> and really want to take a long time. But yeah, so you write it. Some languages end up um, what's called bootstrapping. Mm -hmm. So, you know, C wasn't first written in C, but then eventually they got to the point where you could write the C compilers in C itself and, and bootstrap it. Yep. But, um, oh, we also didn't talk about the fact that Erlang runs in a virtual machine. Oh, yeah. Not, definitely. not directly on the hardware. So that's two virtual machine um, programming languages in a row. 
All right, yep. did, you, did you figure it out? What well, apparently, for? apparently, prologue doesn't stand for anything. So, <laughs> oh, fail, Jason. You're you're getting closer to being voted off. Cut. Oh no! You put me in the hot seat, and then you failed. I know. That's a you just you, turn the table. You have to. Yeah. Now you have a chance to like double dare. You can double hot seat. Oh no! I don't think I'll be that mean. Can I take the high road? <laughs> you can. You can take the high. I'm gonna take the high road. I choose that for a hundred. Um. um but yeah, so Erlang is implemented in in Prolog, which is uh, which is another functional language, and um, um, Prolog is 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 somewhat similar to Erlang, but it doesn't have um, a lot of the sort of uh, ease of use. I feel like I feel like Prolog is very difficult, to sort of uh, you know get your head around. And I did a lot of Prolog uh, in your own know, university, um, so we'll definitely you know make a show out of that. Okay, all right. But uh, in yeah, future. Erlang definitely in the same way as sort of Python makes your life easier as a developer um, of C or C plus plus. Um, Erlang definitely makes your life easier if you're a Prolog developer. Interesting. Very yeah. good. All right. Well, is that all we got for this week? I think so. I think that just by week. We, I think we. All right. I don't, I don't think we have picked what we're going to cover next. No, so, so opportunity for you to write in and tell us what you'd like to hear. That's right. And influence the future. If you have a favorite, you know, we have a list of languages that um, that uh, we want to explore. But um, if you have a particular language you're interested in and we haven't covered it yet, we can easily move it to the front of the queue. Yep. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, give us any feedback, any info. Um, you know, rate us on iTunes if, if you like the podcast. Rate us subscribe. if it's good. If it's not, just send us an email. And wait till we make it better and then rate us. <laughs> That's right. Uh, definitely subscribe so you can get the latest episodes and stay up to date and all that. All right. And, uh, if that's it, uh, I guess we'll sign off. Yeah, this is uh, Jason Gauchi signing off. And this is Patrick Wheeler. Until next bye week, that'll be it. See you later, guys. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.